What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the vlog. Uh, I got a couple of things I want to talk about today with respect to cameras and video and what I've learned and things I've learned and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, a brief rundown of what I'm expecting there, what I want to cover. Uh, I want to talk real quickly about the uh, rumored announcement of a professional grade Canon EOS R. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the dual button, uh, dual rear button autofocus configuration that I, video that I just posted last Thursday. Uh, more on the whys behind it, not so much on it itself. And then I have some lessons I've learned. That, so I started doing these vlogs to talk about things I learned shooting video, trying to get better at shooting video. And uh, I had some lessons learned from shooting that uh, autofocus video that I want to talk about so um, and share uh, so let's start real quickly Canon rumors is uh, believes rumoring whatever you want to call it they have high confidence in their thing that Canon is going to announce um, February 13th or somewhere around there so later this week a professional level EOS R it's probably it looks from their rumored specifications it looks like it's kind of going to be on par with a 5d class camera um, i'm not going to get too into the specs but i have what i wanted to talk about because i'm obviously if they announce it this week i'm going to be talking about it again this week but um i gotta say looking at the specs and what they're sort of talking about that it's probably the first bit of camera gear I've kind of gotten excited for in many years. Um, I think the 5D Mark IV was the last camera that kind of I looked at and went, yeah, that's pretty nice. I really got to get one of those and um, ordered one. I pretty much believe I pre-ordered one. Um, I've wanted to move to mirrorless sort of off and on, but there's nothing out there that really does what I want. And, uh, you know, big part of this is that dual rear button F configuration that I just, you know, did a video on. Not having that in, you know, basically that's become such a critical part of my shooting in um, many environments and conditions that not having that in a mirrorless camera is you know, something I'm not entirely ready to or willing to sort of or ready to work around and my find my 5D Mark IVs are more than adequate for me right now. And so it's just been a waiting game to, you know, see who gets or, well, see that Canon when Canon gets around to it, uh, getting out this kind of camera. So uh, if this actually turns out to have like, pro DSLR style or level ergonomics and functionality and not the kind of consumer level stuff that Canon's put out on the EOS R and the EOS RP. Uh, I'm cautiously excited, cautiously optimistic. I think this is, like I said, the first time in at least four or five years where I've sort of looked at a rumor and gone, yeah, okay, I, I can get behind being excited to see this product come to market. Uh, you know, even if the product's a little different than the rumor, uh, just the to talk it, or the rumors. The basis of the rumor is more that they're talking a, like I said, serious professional level camera and not the the more consumer grade or enthusiast grade cameras that the EOS R's have been. Uh, so. Like I said, I'll talk about this more if it gets announced this week or when it gets announced, um, you know, one way or another, either because I'm excited about it or because I'm not, uh, you know, it turns out that it doesn't look like it's going to be as good as, you know, maybe advertised, whatever. Uh, but I will talk about this more when it gets announced. Uh, so moving on, I want to talk about rear button focusing and the dual button focusing. And I want to talk about... Um, more of the why instead of the how, because uh, I talked briefly in the article or in the video about the one of the big whys of rear button focusing uh, is it gives you control over the AF system. It's it's something that uh, 
you know, and this is the, is, in my opinion, this is the biggest selling point, is it gives you control over what the camera's doing. So you're not, you're not putting yourself in a situation where, you know, you're hoping the camera does the right thing or you're hoping the camera doesn't mess something up when you've got it set up the way you want it. Uh, but there's another benefit that I have found, and uh, it's a consistency thing. Um, so this one is a little bit more complicated to talk about, I think, and a little bit more... It's not as, as simple or clear-cut or just as easy to say, hey, it's a, uh, you know, gives you control and you can move on. So, the, um, one of the things that I've sort of spent a lot of time looking into is, it, now, I, I should probably preface this with one uh, I have never, uh, to, to say that I overthink things is probably an understatement in a lot of cases. I've spent a lot of time thinking about things and why I do things because for me it's important to understand why I'm doing something, not just how I'm doing something, uh, especially when it comes to communicating how to do something and why you should do it. Uh, I've always been really frustrated with the in the first five or six years well I should say in the entirety of the time that I've been doing photography because I'm always looking at what other photographers do I'm always looking at what uh, you know potentially you know even much better and much worse just what other photographers do because I can't necessarily ensure, you know, guarantee that anything I'm doing is optimal. It may work, but there may be something that I've completely missed that works so much better. And like, I just, it, it's a creative field and it's useful, I find, to be able to look at what other photographers are doing creative, both creatively and how they're achieving that end. And one of the things that has always frustrated me, especially early on when I was getting started in photography, is most photographer, photographers that were providing this kind of learn how to do things type uh, content, either in video or on in text, uh, very quickly fell into appeal to authority fallacies. Um, their argument was essentially do it this way because I do it that way and it works for me and therefore if you don't do it this way you're doing it wrong. Uh, not that any of them said that directly or you know as concisely as that but it was the I couldn't couldn't tell you why I do this this way just I do it this way and look I've been published in National Geographic so you should do what I say. Uh, and that always uh, did, never sat well with me. I never liked that. I found that to be immensely frustrating or irritating from a, just a in general perspective because one, well, one of the things that I've always, you know, or I've found very quickly in not just photography but in a lot of things is uh, we're not all wired the same way mentally like we don't think the same way we have different mental models of how things should work or how things do work or how we expect things to work and when something doesn't mesh with our mental model it it's a little kind of grading um, hurdle like it's one thing like you have to constantly start thinking you or think about it you it isn't just something that disappears and now of course you can do something enough and re sort of rebuild your mental model uh, to you know not make to that so that's not a problem but uh it's like when uh, new photographers or would would ask me, you know, I've got a point and shoot. I want to upgrade to a DSLR or a mirrorless or whatever. What brand should I get? You know, is Sony any good? Should I get a Canon? What about Nikon, etc.? Uh, my response has always been essentially, go to a camera store where they have some demo models that you can pick up and take some t test pictures in the store with, 
and see which camera feels right to you, both the ergonomics and the, um, the way it works, the, what the controls do, because there's differences, fundamental differences in the way Canon approaches a camera UI versus Nikon versus Sony and so on and so forth. And these little things, while they're not world shattering, I mean, I've shot with Nikon cameras and I was perfectly capable of producing pictures with Nikon cameras, but it was always a little tiny, tiny bit like frustrating to me because I would go to do something and then I would have to remember, wait, no, it's a Nikon. They don't do this this way. I have to do it this other way. Um, and I could see where if I had spent, you know, a thousand hours and 10,000 pictures shooting with that camera, I would get to a point where, you know, it was natural for me to do it that way. But through that whole time, I would be kind of going like, no, it goes this way or it does this thing or whatever. And again, this isn't, you know, a, to bag on Nikon cameras because I know people who, uh, you know, I like Canon's ergonomics and control and user interface layout. I know uh, I have very good friends that are photographers that you put them behind a Canon camera and they have the same grading frustration with the gear that I have with Nikon gear. They can use it, but it's just not, doesn't work the way they expect it to work or they think it should work. And therefore they have to constantly kind of fight with their themselves to make, to get to where they need to be. Uh, so this isn't, as I said, this isn't a, uh, I don't like do it this way because I'm telling you to do it this way. I think you should do it the way you, you need to do it, but when somebody presents a new way of doing things, they should be able to articulate why the way they're doing it is good or works or is better or foundation sort of premise to that that's not just because uh, I said so, essentially. So uh, in the autofocus dual rear button autofocus video, I mentioned talking a little bit about uh, the big reason that I like rear button focusing and the big reason, the big argument for rear button focusing is you give control. And in this video, as I started this section, I mentioned consistency. And so one of the things that I have done over the years is I have spent a lot of time looking at the lessons learned in the you know military law enforcement and defensive, um, I want to say shooting, but defensive, uh, practical defensive community. Um, not so much in the shooting and how to, to like shoot better with a gun or something like that, but in the the military, uh, the U.S. military especially, but almost every military globally has spent a tremendous amount of money and time looking at stress responses and how to better train soldiers to deal with and react when they are sort of under fire having a stress response. Uh, because physiologically things happen. You, you're, you have an adrenaline dump. Your higher order brain functions sort of get put to the side. A whole lot more of your mental capacity gets taken up with what you could call sort of primal things. Oh, and I should add astronauts, tra space training, NASA stuff. Uh, add that into the list because they have the same kind of, uh, you know, if there's an emergency on the International Space Station, everybody's getting in a massive adrenaline dump, but they still have to be able to think and work through the problem. And so all these agencies have put a lot of money into understanding how to train people to deal with stress responses. And the big takeaway that I've made from, from a photography perspective is fundamentally you want to, or I want to at least, train to produce uh, an ingrained behavior. You know, you could call it something second nature to you. Uh, so when I'm 
faced with two grizzly bears fighting or in a potentially dangerous situation with a, a, a wild animal or, you know, under the gun for some reason and there's a stress response. I mean, now, uh, say, two grizzlies fighting not that far away from me is going to produce a much more substantial stress response than, say, having an art director breathing down your neck uh, in a model shoot or something like that in an air-conditioned, uh, you know, carefully climate-controlled studio. Uh, but there's still going to be a stress response. And one of, like I said, one of the first things that sort of goes when you are having that adrenaline dump kind of thing is your higher order, your clearer thinking. Um, in the aviation community, they actually teach techniques to get you to just basically stop and collect yourself and then start working the problem, um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but so, as I said, you need to be able to, or, or I feel that you need to be able to respond to things uh, sort of from that ingrained behavior, that second nature response. And then, of course, there's also a time factor. Uh, this is more so in, like, say, sports and wildlife photography or whatever, that you have animals or players or something going on, and you have to be able to track and keep up with whatever is happening, and you have there's only so much thought process, there's only so much, you call it CPU time, that your brain has available to deal with a, the problem that you're, you're, you're um, facing. So, you know, if it's a, an athlete running, you know, like composition is important, focus is critically important, uh, exposure is important, but maybe not as important as focus and composition because with modern cameras you can fix a Made fairly substantial, actually, errors in exposure in post, um, at least if you're shooting raw, and maybe not so much if you're shooting JPEG, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And so you, you need to be able to have a system set up in your camera uh, that you're working with where you are sort of fluidly and easily moving through... Um, the, the situation, second nature, camera controls get out of the way. And this is kind of why I go back to either, you know, buying camera a camera that you fit to, that works for you. Um, and so this whole second nature thing, this whole ingrained behavior thing, um, really comes down to the more consistent the way you do things, the faster and more applicable it is as an ingrained behavior. Uh, so using the, the like autofocus manual focus example, when I got started uh, or was starting out doing photography and I would do uh, night landscapes, I didn't use when I got started rear button focusing. I hadn't learned about it yet. I didn't really appreciate and understand the advantages and so on and so forth. So I was just shooting like most people who's got a camera, you know, using the shutter release to autofocus, etc. And if I had a problem where I couldn't autofocus or I didn't want the autofocus to run, those rare circumstances, I would flip the autofocus manual focus switch on the lens to manual focus. So I'd go out to do like night landscapes and night landscapes and astrophotography are very much in the autofocus doesn't help you that much. Stars are tiny, they're primarily what you primarily want in focus. Uh, infinity focus, especially on Canon cameras where infinity focus floats, uh, infinity focus is a it floats with temperature, I should say. So infinity focus is something that you really need to look through the lens to see. You can't just turn the lens all the way to the stop and hope the lens is at infinity. And the, you know, so that's one of the rare situations where I would have used the uh, autofocus manual focus switch. So now think about sort of let me talk through kind of how this works. So it's night landscapes. So I've been awake all day. There's already a fatigue factor coming in because 
uh, you know, and especially if this was a night landscape that I was doing, if I was traveling where I might've been up at well, you know, four in the morning or something to get a sunrise. So I've been up for an, an incredibly long time. I'm already starting to get fatigued and fatigue causes you to make mistakes. It causes you to miss things. It's not being fatigued is very important. Uh, for all kinds of things and you know it's important to not if you're not it's important for not making mistakes even like in photography so I'm already fatigued I'm going out it's late at night now if I'm shooting at home the closest dark sky sights to somebody living in South Florida in you know this is a basically like a hundred hundred and fifty mile by thirteen mile urban sprawl that makes up um, from sort of uh, the tip of Miami at home, or the tip of Dade County and Homestead all the way up to West Palm Beach. Uh, it's just city, city, city. So there are no dark sky sites in South Florida. Uh, you got to go somewhere to, you know, away from that. And, the, you know, going out into the Everglades is an hour to two hour drive to get to a really good dark sky site. So I'm driving out. You get out there and... Suppose you're now looking to get the, say, galactic center in a certain place. So you may have to wait several hours, potentially, until you have the composition or you have the, the sky in the state that you want it in for your shoot. Uh, so you do some shooting. Now, if you're sort of thinking about things, you make sure your camera's set up before it gets too late and you get too tired, you really start screwing things up. So you flip the autofocus switch to manual, you focused with live view on a star, uh, you get it nice and sharp, you lock everything down, and you're good to go. Three hours later, two hours later, you're shooting your, your galactic center and the position that you want it in, etc., etc., and you're uh, you know, done shooting. Now, like I said, in most cases, I'm tired, so I'm not thinking, okay, what is this one thing that I didn't do or that I did that I don't normally do that I need to undo? Flip the manual focus or the lens back to autofocus. I'm thinking, put the gear away, go somewhere and get to sleep. So pack up the gear, jump in the car, drive home, etc. I'm not, you know, in fact, I might not even be thinking about that. I switched the autofocus manual focus switch because I don't I hardly ever use it, and so when you combine um, fatigue and something you don't do an awful lot, there's a lot of room to forget that you bothered to do it or that you did it in the first place. So you get home, you go through your pictures, you download your card the next day, whatever, you clean your gear, you put it away. I'm not thinking anymore like I got to remember to set the lens back to autofocus. And then, you know, fast forward to the next time you go to use the lens and you're trying to focus and the lens isn't focusing and you get that adrenaline shot of, you know, camera gear is expensive, lenses are expensive, they break, uh, not all the time, but they break. So, oh crap, and they're expensive to fix when they break. Oh crap, my lens is broke or my camera's broke, what's wrong? Um, and in fact, this is something I really like about the 5D Mark IV because it shows the state of the autofocus system in the viewfinder. So if your lens is in manual focus, it will say MF in the viewfinder. Now, I don't always see that, but it's something that's sort of present and available to you as a photographer to see. So you're not just like, oh, you know, it's a, a little bit more, you get that initial shot of adrenaline when it doesn't work, but it's a little bit easier that if you're looking in the viewfinder and you, oh, it's in manual focus easy fix and you move on. Whereas with uh, rear button focusing, now that I've moved to that, I never put the lens into manual focus. So all of the situations where I would put the lens in manual focus to uh, shoot a certain kind of subject matter, a night landscape, etc., which were already fairly rare, so it was already a pretty easy situation for me to run into both on the, uh, I focused everything manually and then hit the shutter release and it screwed up the focus and 
I forgot to put the lens back into autofocus and the next time I went to use the camera it was appeared broken because it wasn't focusing even though it was just the switch. Um, I had I'm circumventing all of those problems. I'm no longer worrying about having to switch the lens into manual focus. I'm no longer worrying about having to switch the lens out of manual focus because the autofocus system doesn't trigger until the button's pushed. And this makes the consistency of push the button to focus, don't push the button not to focus, which Yes, it takes some getting used to, it takes some of that initial training to sort of deal with, but in my experience, the consistency of having that similar load, like it's always a, a, a you know, I know if I'm shooting, okay, I want autofocus, and with the dual button, rear button system, I'm, I know I want either spot focus or, you know, which is how I'd normally have the camera or single point focus, which is how I'd normally have the camera set up, or I want tracking area focus because something's moving. Uh, I know that that's just which button to hit. It's, there is some, you know, certainly there is some tiny bit of cognitive load in terms of having to hit another button to focus but it's a consistent cognitive load and it's something that I've is is because of that consistency it's easy to train to that operation it's easy to train to you're always doing this regardless under your own thought mental control you're always either focusing or not focusing uh, but you're always using the camera the same way. And even like when you get into a manual focus type situation, you're using the camera as a, you know, the same way. You might be turning the focus ring to focus instead of hitting the button. But like in those situations, you should have the time to be able to think through the, you know, the fine tuning of focus. But it's still a consistent interaction with the camera. Uh, and so, like I said, this is, that was a big part of why I like, uh, or that's sort of the secondary reason to why I like rear button focusing. I have messed up shots and I have thrown off a, se a session of shooting because either the camera autofocus, you know, before I went to rear button focusing, because either the camera went to autofocus and messed up my focus or because I had that initial shot of adrenaline response, oh crap, my camera gear is broken, and like, you know, I fix it, it's not broken, but for like the next 15 minutes, I'm still recovering from that, like, I'm not thinking so much about composition anymore, I'm thinking about like, wow, calm down, the camera's not broken, I hope, you know, that, that little bit of doubt that creeps in. So, that's sort of a, a broader discussion. Like I said, I didn't include that in the, the video because obviously it's gone on for a lot longer than, uh, you know, a few minutes or whatever. It would have made that video excessively long. But that brings me to um, the last topic that I want to uh, talk about in this video, which is that video as a whole, the dual rear button autofocusing video as a whole. So when I started doing video last year, seriously. That was one of the first videos that I really wanted to put together and do. And part of, a lot of that came from the fact that it's, uh, I found it to it, find that technique to be incredibly useful and incredibly powerful, uh, you know, an incredibly useful and powerful thing that you can do with Canon's higher end DSLRs, as well as something that I don't see or haven't seen talked about a tremendous amount from people who use Canon DSLRs. Like there's a lot of stuff and even Canon, like I never have seen an awful lot of like official Canon video or whatnot looking at setting your camera up that way and how it can be useful. And sort of with the EOS R release and not having a lot of clear 
uh, understanding of where Canon's going with their mirrorless cameras, and the fact that this isn't a huge, I don't think from, at least from what I've seen, I don't feel like that this is a hugely popular um, or well understood or widely used functionality. Like there's a level of concern for me that the functionality may disappear because I mean, I can explain it away in the EOS R because the EOS R isn't technically uh, a professional level camera, it's a more prosumer level camera from feature set wise, but what happens in the, you know, more high end EOS R's as they come to market? And of course, this is something that's just as useful in a mirrorless camera as it's useful in a DSLR. The changing where the AF gets done or putting it in a mirrorless camera doesn't necessarily make it go away. And even with more sophisticated um, processor-based things like, for example, Sony's IAF that works on animals, uh, I'm not personally comfortable necessarily being in the situation where I'm just entirely always dependent on the camera guessing at the right focus point and guessing at where the eye is. It's, it's, I'm giving up control and in giving up control, I'm inherently at the whim of the camera. And of course, there's situations where, uh, for example, just IAF tracking autofocus, like one of the examples I gave in the video was, uh, a lot of times I might be shooting something that's static and then very quickly need to move to a dynamic environment or a dynamic situation. So I might be shooting a landscape where spot AF on something specific in the landscape or, uh, you know, macro shot even, uh, which with the Canon 100 to 400 and a teleconverter, you can get 50% or nearly 50% macro, macro magnification with essentially a, a wildlife lens. Um, and then all of a sudden a rare bird like a bald eagle or a golden eagle or something is flying overhead and I need to go from, oh, I'm doing this to, oh, I'm shooting this. And it's a very dynamic type, uh, you know, the bird flying is a very dynamic shot. Uh, an IAF may not necessarily, like I might not want to have the camera guessing at autofocus points for me when I'm shooting the first type of composition and I certainly want it to try and track and guess at what to focus on in the second. Uh, but anyway, I haven't seen this talked about a lot and like I said, uh, I wanted to make the video and I've been sitting on this video for more than six months largely because I just didn't know how to do it, how to get through the video. The um, there's a, a complexity in the, quote, B-roll, for lack of a better word, the um, intercutting to doing something on the camera that, like, doesn't exist if I'm just cutting to a landscape or cutting to some action or cutting to something that isn't a specifically orchestrated uh, movement motion thing that I'm stepping through in the camera that needs to have things happen sort of on beat with a recorded, uh, a scripted recorded dialogue. And I couldn't figure out how to do it. And I'm still not convinced that the way I did it is the best way to do it. So um, if you have some experience with this and you're not flailing around like a fish out of water like I am, uh, I'd love to hear in the comments sort of what your technique for doing that kind of shot is. Um, because again, I'm always looking to learn. Uh, but, so this is what I ended up doing. I ended up shooting the entire um, A-roll, me to camera, the entire scripted piece uh, in one shot, one take. It just read through everything and did the whole thing and I didn't worry about trying to manipulate a camera or anything like that. I then went back and in the first attempt at doing the sort of b-roll footage of the camera manipulations stuck on my headphones and started trying to listen to you know through the video while as 
I needed to do camera manipulations, I would be trying to manipulate the camera sort of in sync with what I was saying. And I found that to generally not work for me. Um, I would, because it wasn't, the, the camera manipulation part wasn't necessarily just click here, click here, click here, done. It was click here, these are the options, and this is what each option does. And then, you know, some indeterminate amount of time down the road, I would be doing the uh, pick which option sort of and done part. And timing that with the, the video, you know, while listening to the video, I found incredibly difficult. And I messed up plenty of takes that, I mean, granted, I probably could have saved them in post, but uh, I didn't, I found that just to be an incredibly difficult way to work. So what I ended up doing was just shooting the B-roll as, um, I knew what, what steps I had to do. I had a little cheat sheet that said, go to this menu, go to this menu, go to this menu, uh, or push these buttons, you know, to get there. Uh, and I just set the camera up, got everything lit, ready to go, hit record on the camera recording, and then stepped through the menus without really much concern about how it lined up with the audio part, the, the scripted audio and the A-roll. And where I messed up in this, I think, was I shot my B-roll. So I shot the A-roll and I'm shooting all of these videos at 24 frames a second. Uh, I shot the B-roll at 24 frames a second as well. And that was where I think my big goof was. I really should have shot the B-roll at 60 frames a second. And the reason for that, I going to argue is in this specific situation under these conditions where I may need to play with the timing in uh, post, 60 frame per second video slowed down to 24 frames a second is slow but smooth. You will notice potentially that it looks slowed down, but it only looks slowed down. It doesn't look jerky. 24 frame per second video slowed down a similar amount gets into being really jerky. It does not take an awful lot of frame rate loss from 24 frames a second before the video that is being displayed is stuttery as opposed to being just a slow continuous motion. Uh, and I think sort of, uh, see, it's hard for me to even say that I have a good takeaway on this because, well, the truth is I don't even know if there is a good way to do this. Like I'm stumbling through in the dark kind of on this, trying to find something that works and remembering that if it looks good, it is good uh, as sort of an underlying principle. Uh, but I'm definitely coming to the conclusion that shooting that kind of B-roll, if you shoot it at a higher frame rate, you have the ability to slow it down better than if you shoot it at the same necessarily frame rate that you're shooting your regular A-roll in or that you're going to deliver in. And 60 frame per second video played back at 24 frames a second doesn't look bad. Uh, it obviously doesn't have the same motion blur that 24 frame per second video with 180 degree shutter angle has. Uh, so if you're really paying a lot of attention to, you know, the maintaining a consistent motion blur across everything, uh, that's obviously going to be a problem. But it's clean, it's smooth, it's maybe a little less blurred and a little too sharp, but it's not horrendous in terms of the look. And then of course you could slow it down two and a half times to native 24 frames per second. And then you get that, some of that like slow motion B-roll kind of thing going on. So anyway, I have rambled on a lot longer than I really anticipated rambling on. Um, if you've made it this far, thank you very much for watching. Um, I appreciate your time because uh, this is a lot longer than I anticipated, but um, I guess 
ending spiel stuff. So if you like this video, please smash the like button for more content like this. Uh, please consider subscribing to my channel. Uh, I also am doing tech tips and I'm going to eventually get to doing like travel stuff because that's really kind of where I'm sort of hoping to take all of this is to get all the way out into shooting in the field. Uh, if you want more written, if you're kind of like me and you like reading content, technical content, more than watching it because you can skim through it to sort of the important parts, uh, for more written content on along the same lines, camera stuff, camera reviews, travel and gear reviews, that kind of thing, uh, check out my website at pointsandfocus.com. And as always, thank you for watching and until next time.